morning, everyone. I'm Pam Valentine, and I'm the CEO, the interim CEO of Alberta Innovates Health Solutions. I'd like to welcome you today to the Health Policy S Speaker Series, presented in partnership with the Institute of Health Economics, represented here today by Dr. Philip Jacobs, Director of Research Collaborations, somewhere in the back over there. I'm also pleased to welcome Dr. David Swan, MLA, for Calgary Mountain View, in the middle of the room. Uh, today's Health Policy Speakers presentation, in addition to be part, being part of our regular series, is one of several events being held in the province as part of the National Health Ethics Week, which runs from April 4th to 10th. As a partner in the Health Research Ethics Harmonization Initiative in the province, and home to the Health Research Ethics Board of Alberta, AIHS has great interest in ethics and its many implications in the health system. As such, I'd like to welcome a few of our colleagues from within the community of Alberta's three research ethics boards. So please give a, a wave as I say your name. Dr. D Dale Dewhurst, Chair of REBA's Cancer Committee. Susan Babcock, Administrative Acting Executive Director at the Research Ethics Office at U of A. And Corinne Morin, Executive Director of Platforms and Ethic in Ethics Innovations at AIHS. One of the many facets of health research ethics includes secondary use health data. Discussions are happening not only in Alberta, but across Canada and North America about the ethics of integrating and using our health data. This is why it is so important to learn from the experience of other jurisdictions and tap into the expertise of leaders of bioethics, such as Dr. Eric Meslin, our guest speaker today. It's an honor and a delight for me to introduce Dr. Meslin, who has recently returned to Canada from a long career in the US to take up the position of President and CEO of the Council of Canadian Academies, housed in Ottawa. Dr. Meslin joined the Council in February of this year, bringing with him more than 25 years of experience in science policy in both university and government settings. In 2015, Dr. Meslin was appointed Vice Chair of the UK Biobank Ethics and Governance Council. He has been an advisor to domestic and international organizations, including the World Health Organization and the Canadian Institute for Health mm -hmm. Research, and sat on committees of the Institute of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health and the Board of Directors of Genome Canada. Born in Canada, Dr. Meslin received his BA from York University and his MA and PhD from Georgetown University in Washington, DC, both in philosophy, bioethics, and science policy. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Meslin. Thank you very much for the, the welcome and uh, for coming out this morning. It's a, a delight to be here, uh, not only returning uh, to Canada, that's becoming a common refrain, he came back, he came back, which I'm, I'm delighted to come back, but I'm also uh, pleased to come back to, uh, to Alberta where I have a number of uh, very close friends and colleagues and, uh, and really to come back at a time that I think is very exciting for Canada, uh, for science, uh, for evidence, for policy and uh, you can take uh, the guy out of bioethics but you can't take bioethics out of the guy. I think this is just a spectacular time for the kind of work uh, that all of you are, are doing so I'm, uh, I'm grateful to help participate in that, in that conversation. Um, I should probably remind you, because I'm an ethics guy, that um, some of the things I'm going to be talking about this morning are part of that long history that was just described, research that I have undertaken with colleagues elsewhere, and I think it's only appropriate that I disclose that some of the things that I'm going to be talking about occurred during my years at, uh, at Indiana uh, University where I, uh, I directed their Center for Bioethics for a number of years, so I'm disclosing a couple of grants that, uh, that supported that. You heard about two of my affiliations, one with the UK Biobank and one with uh, Genome Canada. I additionally sit on their Science Industry and Advisory Committee, and in both of those cases I receive a, I think it's a modest honorarium. Uh, nothing that uh, forces me to make decisions that I wouldn't otherwise do, but I prefer to let you know that uh, that happens. And uh, naturally, in, uh, in situations like this, it's always appropriate to say these are my words, 
um, clearly their mind because they're coming out of my mouth, but I also realize that um, there might be a misapprehension that I'm speaking on behalf of the organization that I now lead, the, the CCA. I, I'm not speaking on behalf of CCA, though you'll see some remarks that I have about this uh, wonderful new organization that I'm, uh, that I'm joining. Uh, so with that, let me just remind you that we've been thinking about uh, data and ethics for quite a long time. Um, it is probably not unfamiliar uh, to most of you that um, our former champion and uh, visionary in Canada, Marshall McLuhan, had a few things to say about information and, and data. And this was uttered um, in 1962. And I rather enjoy the description for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, McLuhan always had this ability to uh, look to the future and say things that uh, were challenging and, and interesting. Some of them became memes on their own. Some of them uh, became uh, fodder. But in every instance, uh, they were things that challenge us. And for him to have said something about data and its impact on everything about us. I mean, imagine to say uh, now that uh, our role in the data environment is going to affect us at what is practically a metaphysical level, the less we exist. What a powerful statement about uh, data. Um, we may be returning to, or at least reminding ourselves of this, not only throughout this morning's uh, discussion, but as we go about the work of thinking about the role that we all play uh, with individuals and in society. So I keep, I'll, I'll ask you to keep that in mind as we make our way, as we make our way through this morning. Um, I want to sort of put some of this into some context. Not only was uh, the McLuhan quote, something that reminded us that we've been thinking about data for a while. There is a very well established uh, bioethics tradition in thinking about how information management affects uh, patients, families, researchers, and the like. Uh, this slide, which of course includes a delightful old photo of Sir William Osler, summarizes probably 2,000 years of history in, in bioethics in a couple of dot points, which suggests that the way we think about the management of information and, and health information in particular um, has always been and should continue to be focused on the patient. Uh, Paul Ramsey's text, The Patient as Person, became one of the Bibles of bioethics in the late uh, 1960s, early 1970s, uh, largely because it helped summarize what later became a, a bioethical approach to thinking about persons and and patients as individuals who were autonomous, who could make decisions on their own behalf, but who needed to be uh, respected for who they were as individuals. And that touching them without their consent was not only a legal violation, but um, a morally inappropriate uh, act. The rise of informed consent, which we all think is so obvious and so uh, straightforward now, was not such um, as, uh, as little as uh, 40 years ago. In fact, going across jurisdictions uh, in Canada, the US, Australia, France, uh, the UK, and a number of other places that I've, uh, I've spent some time the last uh, few decades, uh, just shows how fragile that history is and how we're still creating uh, models for adapting uh, to, uh, to new environments. I refer you to the current debate going on in the US about the revision to what's known as the common rule. The, federal policy for the protection of human subjects, uh, which took a decade uh, to revise and is still being revised literally as we speak, largely because of debates about whether things like de-identified data should still be considered uh, technically identifiable and required consent. So this is not a done deal, take it off the list, consent, figured that out, respect patients, got that one, let's move on. This is an ongoing, uh, an ongoing activity. And same with research. And by the way, I'm not just using old grainy pic, uh, pictures of, uh, of white guys uh, to make a particular point. There's lots of old grainy pictures of, uh, of uh, uh, women and uh, there are color pictures as well. My point is that this paradigm that I'm referring to, in this case a research paradigm, 
has a long and illustrious, I think, history uh, in science with respect to data. So Henry Beecher, whose famous paper in the New England Journal in 1966 uh, summarized for many people the first public discussion by a, a physician about the role of, of science and evidence and the protections that are in place. Beecher, of course, is famous in that 1966 paper for documenting 23 cases of uh, unethical research sponsored and conducted by the federal government in the U.S. and elsewhere and published in the top journals around the world, Science, Nature, Cell, and the like. This was uh, just two years after the Declaration of Helsinki and uh, less than 20 years after the Nuremberg Code. And Beecher went into the literature and found 23 cases. Actually, he found 50 cases, but the New England Journal said you could only publish 23. Your paper's too long. You've got to shorten it. Fascinating topic. We can uh, discuss that later. A little bit of editing at the New England Journal, which uh, still happens today. Uh, but Beecher's quote, uh, if you can see it in the text box, is that they're the more reliable safeguard beyond any regulation or guideline is provided by the presence of an intelligent, informed, conscientious, compassionate, responsible investigator. Uh, that's why I've titled this slide and the prior slide, The Virtuous, in the case of the previous one, uh, a physician or clinician, and in this one, The Virtuous Investigator. It's a reminder that no set of regulations or guidelines can absolutely assure either the respect for persons uh, or the intentional um, ethical commitment to high quality care. You actually need people. Um, I refer you to uh, the German Medical Association's 1933 guidelines for medical research, which were some of the most progressive in the world. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the Nazi regime chose to ignore them and, and went on a different path. So you can have the best set of guidelines in the world, but without people to implement them and care about them, you're not getting anywhere. Um, this topic has been interesting to me, the topic which I might summarize briefly as the privacy confidentiality conundrum. So on the left side, of course, you see a, a little screenshot of the Hippocratic Oath, um, not written by Hippocrates, written by a group of scholars over many years, um, but we still attribute it to one single person on the island of, uh, of uh, Kos 2,500 years ago. But regardless of the provenance of the authors uh, themselves, there have been statements not only in uh, West, the Western uh, medical ethics tradition, but one going back even further, uh, the Chiraka Samhita from India, uh, Chinese medical ethics include statements about secrets and confidentiality that are every bit as enlightened as, as uh, the Hippocratic injunction to respect the secrets which are confided in me even after the patient has died. Um, that might be a nice skill testing question for those who don't know their medical ethics history and to ask uh, someone uh, contempora uh, contemporaneously, uh, what do you think about this statement? Do you think it applies now? And how, how, well, how good a job are we doing? Uh, think about the role of, uh, of, of biobanks when this comes to mind. The screenshot from Mark Siegler's uh, paper from the New England Journal, which I've extracted from a, from a textbook, with one of the best titles ever, Confidentiality in Medicine, a Decrepit Concept, uh, was a, a shout out to a problem that had, had not been addressed um, significantly um, in either the literature or in practice. And this was the issue of the need to know or the right to know. And Mark Siegler, a very prominent founder of, of the field of bioethics from the University of Chicago, a physician ethicist, uh, wanted to know um, who actually claimed that they had a right to or a need to know patients' medical information contained in their physical paper medical record. Um, there wasn't any, there weren't any data ab about that, nor did we know what the number was. There was a presumption on behalf of, of patients that their physician, a nurse, uh, uh, someone caring for them might have a need to know information about them, but that was about it. Siegler tracked this, wrote it up in the New England Journal, again, a nice place to publish stuff, great impact factor, and uh, found that anywhere from 15 to 100 people within the University of Chicago health system uh, claimed that they had a need or a right to know. A shocking number, um, I don't know whether that's a high number, a low number, but it was more than the two or three that patients presumed uh, people had, a, that, that patients assumed uh, were those who had access to it, which led Siegler 
uh, to make, again, this is a McLuhan-like uh, prescient observation because this paper, as you see, was written in 1982. At some point, Ziegler said, most patients should have an opportunity to review their medical record to make informed choices about whether their entire record is to be available to everyone or whether certain portions of the record are privileged and should only be accessible to their principal physician. A great question. We're still having that conversation in 2016. I'm not saying we should not have that conversation. I'm just reminding us that there is a history uh, that we are relearning and probably relearning and relearning and eventually we'll probably have to move beyond reminding ourselves uh, of its history and make some progress. And then everything changed. Along came um, one of the most interesting activities in the history of, of science, policy, and society, which was the mapping and sequencing of the human genome. Um, I'm particularly um, attached to this story having played a small uh, role in it. In fact, um, in the top left-hand corner, that's a meeting in the East Room of the White House, which I had the privilege to attend um, when I worked um, at the Genome Institute, where on the left is Craig Venter, in the middle, of course, is Bill Clinton, and on the right-hand side is uh, Francis Collins, then the Genome Institute director, now the NIH director. On the, uh, the large screen TV, uh, was uh, Tony Blair from uh, number 10. So this was an international effort to celebrate the first draft. It was a very moving moment, especially, I don't know what your political persuasion is, but since I worked for the Clinton administration, I don't mind saying that I thought that Bill Clinton um, in his political life was uh, second to none as a, as a visionary. And his speechwriters were also second to none, so he described in that room um, with Watson sitting in the front row, um, of course, that the last time a president, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here and I'm no Bill Clinton, the last time a president was in a room uh, with this kind of people to look at a map, it was looking at a, at a map of the United States that uh, um, uh, Thomas Jefferson had commissioned uh, from, uh, uh, from his experts, Meriwether uh, Post. So it's a, a tremendous uh, environment. I use it as a, as a slide to remind us that the genome, it's not that there's a, a BG before genome and an AG after genome, but in some ways in, in bioethics and health policy, um, the more charitable interpretation of that is that the genome served as an accelerant in many ways. Those topics that I alluded to earlier have always been bubbling along, churning along in hospitals and um, IRBs or REBs or ethics review bodies as they're called around the world. We've always been addressing them. We've always been attentive to them. But there's nothing like the capacity to take little tiny bits of you, uh, turn them into data and information that have the capacity to change lives, as Watson said in his congressional testimony, give me three billion dollars, ten years, and I'll map and sequence the human genome, and the world will be better off because of it. There'll be better treatments, uh, people will be healthier. It was almost like Vannevar Bush's claim in The Endless Frontier, that tremendous text, where he described uh, the benefits to society from science. Everything from better crops uh, to shorter work hours to happier people. It's a tr it was a tremendous statement and Watson, despite some of his uh, moral failings, and he had several. Having a Nobel Prize uh, does not uh, authorize you to speak about bioethics. If your, bio, if your Nobel Prize isn't in bioethics would be as far as I'll, I'll say about Watson. But boy, he sure had a way of convincing an appropriations committee to give him a bunch of money when in, in uh, 1989 we didn't know how to map or sequence a human genome. We didn't have uh, next generation sequence. We didn't have first generation sequencers. So this idea of how big science captured the public's attention and then brought bioethics along with it. Um, I ran for two years the ethical, legal, and social implications program of the Human Genome Project, which, thanks to Watson and then uh, Collins, uh, was provided for with first 3% and then 5% of the Genome Institute's annual budget 
for looking at the ethical, legal, and social implications. It's what gave rise in some ways to the GELS program um, at Genome Canada, where topics like privacy, genetic discrimination, stigmatization were on the agenda in an evidence-based environment. Funding scientists to understand what those issues were was seen as the down payment or the deposit on the policy discussion that needed to be had. And everyone knew that this discussion needed to be had. Uh, the genome was only one accelerant. There are several others, um, and I'm just going to use the shortness of my time up here to list a few of my particular favorites. Uh, some of them have risen to the level of, of memes. Um, you can't talk about data without putting the adjective big in front of it now, or bigger. Um, just like translation or innovation, there's a whole set of code words that every one of us in this room uses to show that we're at the adult table and we have the cool set of words when we do, whether it's the elevator speech with our MLAs or MPs or anyone else, we're going to talk about innovation. And if you just say the magic words, certain things are supposed to happen. Um, I haven't seen the, the magic word uttered um, I haven't seen that work well unless the magic word is money and I have it <laughs> and would you like some <laughs> and if I give it to you will you do what I want to which in which case the person on the receiving end says of course now I call that the golden rule it's not the ethics golden rule it's the whoever has the gold makes the rules that golden rule which is really the one that seems to happen. Whoever has the budget gets to control the agenda, and I think we all know that reality. So the nomenclature that we bring into those budget discussions, I think, is important. Data is, is, is critical, and I just, summer, I just put the, the McKinsey uh, slide up, not because I have any um, association with McKinsey, uh, but because they actually did a very nice uh, study, as has BCG and several others. I'm not, I don't work for them. I have no affiliation with these organizations that have summarized what has become the metric, the translational metric of what will you do with this, what will this new thing, this bright shiny object do for you. So I don't want to uh, mistakenly characterize an entire country, the U.S., any more than I would Canada or its provinces as um, in this way, but the, the, the idea that you can add value, $300 billion in value, is an attention grabber. Now we've been thinking about data in lots of other ways. We've been thinking about it as a way to enhance patient care, uh, to drive uh, research agendas and the like. But this coupled with, if you can see this as a piling on, coupled with the genome uh, effort or the genome uh, mantra becomes a very powerful uh, mover to start talking about data, information and knowledge, a kind of uh, pathway uh, to translation that uh, I think we need to spend more time on. Uh, this is just simply a screenshot from Google. This isn't a person that I know, but it's meant to convey the, the topic of electronic health records about which all of us know something and I could probably spend four hours uh, talking about on its own. I'll just summarize a couple of, of points, one of which from um, the Council of Canadian Academies 2015 report that summarized more uptake in, in EMRs. Uh, but the absence of a framework uh, for governing data flow. This may become the issue of our time in, in the space of data and information. And as I'll show you in a minute or two, it's not so much that we have the bright, shiny objects, phenomenal computer technology, incredible bioinformatics capacity. You know, if, if we were to redo the movie The Graduate, the, uh, the utterance of the old uncle uh, to the young guy is not plastics, it's going to be bioinformatics or some ver uh, version of informatics, but because whoever ha controls more of that will control um, uh, pretty much everything. So we're seeing some incredible uh, activity. Canada is beginning to implement EMRs. Every country in the, certainly in the, the G20, is doing something in the area of designing, building, implementing uh, these technologies, all for very good reasons. Better patient care, reduction of iatrogenic uh, disease, better prescribing, better cost control, the list is long. Um, and the last sort of 
collection of, of topics uh, are, are biobanks. And uh, biobanks can, again, preoccupy all of our time, largely because we know so little about them. Um, we did a census, or tried to do a census, on the campus of Indiana University. IU has the largest medical school in the US, little known fact. Um, largest by the number of, of medical students. There are over uh, 400, uh, 400 students uh, in, uh, in each year of their four-year curriculum. It's a massive medical school with a, a very enviable uh, research infrastructure. And I was asked at one point to try and help this one university develop its policy for biobanking. And I said, let's find out what the, the scope of the problem is. We couldn't even determine how many refrigerators there were on, on the campus, let alone how many vials of human biological material there might be in any one of those refrigerators. I can tell you that when I worked for the White House Bioethics Commission, um, we tried to do a census and found ourselves wringing our hands that somewhere around 380 million individual uh, tissue samples were probably collected in the nation's pathology laboratories and, and other uh, places, which probably was, a, was about 20% uh, of the total because it didn't include those samples uh, housed at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, the military uh, resource, which was not public, public knowledge and therefore couldn't be tracked nor did it include any of the biotech or pharmaceutical firms. Massive, massive problem. So this becomes one of those, if we build it, not only will they come, but can we use it? Pharmacogenomics may be just the, the particular uh, cool phrase that we want to use now, uh, precision medicine, targeted therapeutics, lots of things going on. The debate that I referred to with the common rule in the US is happening at this very moment. Uh, because of President Obama's uh, precision medicine initiative and Vice President Biden's moonshot with cancer. So we all know that what we'd like to do is to gather more stuff and then decide what to do with it later. Stuff is my technical term for health information, uh, whether it be contained in a medical record or whether it be contained in a vial of actual tissue or combinations. So why don't we just move forward? Well. It turns out that there are a number of things that give people pause. This is an old slide. It's a three-year-old slide, but it's meant to just convey one big uh, topic, and that is people are afraid of privacy being breached or information being hacked. Uh, the bubble graph shows uh, those losses in breaches of personal information greater than 30,000 records. So there are some familiar names. Uh, Target, uh, Evernote, Adobe, uh, Zappos, even, even Apple. But these are well-known, well-publicized, uh, and they are happening not so much with increasing frequency, but we're learning more about them. This is, in, this is kind of a, a, a bit of background, uh, not noise in the bad sense, but it's that background hum that is constantly reminding us that all of the wonder and all of the excitement from the genome to data to biobanks to health records and all the good things that can happen still are, uh, are not going forward as quickly as we'd like because of this background concern. I want to just describe a little bit of what that uh, concern uh, looks like. So uh, that's end of part one, and this is a two-part talk. Uh, pay attention. I think the ethics are changing a little bit. Now that doesn't mean that th we have to construct an entirely new ethics infrastructure. This is a, a form of what I might call ethical exceptionalism, namely that the type of topics that we're now, that I'm now referring to and, and is the interest of the people in this room may require new ways of deploying the uh, ethical principles and values and commitments and uh, guidelines that we have been using not only ever since Hippocrates or Siegler's view, but that we have been using and congratulating ourselves for our success in, in setting up uh, REBs and the like. The ethics may require some exceptional interpretation as we begin to struggle through some of these uh, challenges. One of them is a data uh, problem. At the end of the day, uh, the, the individuals and the communities who are themselves the principal beneficiaries of all of the wonder that we're describing uh, need to give us permission and not just permission, my preference is we want them to, de to demand of us that we do this. 
So the model of what you might call an excessive protectionism, let's make sure that no one gets hurt. In fact, the model of regulatory action in the US, and I would even say uh, the way we think about these things in Canada is to prevent harm. And that's smart, of course it's smart. In research in particular, uh, we could deploy the Hippocratic uh, injunction of first or at least do no harm, especially if we're not intending to benefit someone directly. You shouldn't hurt them. That makes an awful lot of sense. There's a moral intuition that arises from don't injure, don't harm. So what do people think? Um, again, a, a, a slide that's now, uh, you know, many years old, but comes from work that, uh, that I've done uh, in Australia and others have as well. The, the left half of the slide is a picture of Western Australia, which constitutes half of the entire uh, continent, where research on the uh, Western Australia data set, one of the largest in the world collecting administrative health data, has been on ongoing for, for several decades. Uh, Darcy Holman and, and the group at the University of Western Australia has been looking at this data and uh, wanted to carry out research on it. Right, so administrative health data, hospital admissions, discharges, all the usual stuff, but no one ever bothered to use it for health services research. So before starting that process, got to go to a, a research ethics board and ask for permission to then go to the public and say, may we use information that had been collected on you for health care now in a research capacity? And as my uh, colleague Fiona Stanley and I uh, commented in a an Australian medical journal editorial a number of years ago, when the public was asked after this research ethics review occurred and said you must go to the public, the public were not only supportive of the idea, they questioned why it wasn't already being done. In other words, you mean you haven't been using this data that you've been collecting for research purposes? Why the heck not? Now, it's an easy phrase and you might pass it off as that's charming about Western Australia. Maybe that's how they think there. I'm not so sure that we should make that presumption or really that insulting, draw that insulting conclusion. I think some of it is the way uh, we engage uh, in our civic uh, deliberation about the role of science and society. And they've done a pretty darn good job uh, in Western Australia. This, by the way, if you did it in Indiana, that would not be the answer. The answer would not be, have, why haven't you been using it? It's, no way. I don't want the government getting access to my information. Now, I can say this now. I'm no longer um, uh, at Indiana University. I wasn't burdened by, uh, by any gag order when I was there. But uh, every state has a different political orientation. And uh, in the state of Indiana, there is a, a legitimate concern about the role of government overreaching. It's not unusual in many states. Uh, other states have different views. But the idea that we have that one size fits all, that either we should protect, 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 or we should free the data, free the data, it is uh, simplistic in, in a number of ways. The view of not wanting to share is not unusual uh, when it turns out people don't have a lot of information. So the Western Australia data set is an instance of a particular uh, a feeling. Yes, you should use it. We would like the government to use our data. But over the last 10 or 15 years, there has been a growing body of evidence uh, captured both in uh, the quote from the Health Data Exploration Project and a summary that the cardiologist uh, Eric Tuppel uh, summarized uh, just last year, that more and more studies have shown, and these are good, um, valid, uh, both public opinion polls, uh, focus groups, uh, quite a comprehensive uh, list of, of work that shows that the public is willing to share under certain conditions. And the devil's in the details, what are those conditions? But the idea of no, I don't want to unless you give me a good reason is actually not the dominant theme. The dominant theme is yes, I would like to, but I have these concerns. And if you see how that switches uh, I think we'll get a handle on uh, really where, um, where uh, we, we might need to go. Um, we've done some studies on this. These are old data that uh, largely show that people are willing uh, to participate in biobanking and willing uh, to have information shared.
Now, all of this focus on patients is laudable. And believe me, in the field of bioethics, we all cut our teeth on being concerned about the impact on patients of medical interventions, of poor consent. And rightly so. The uh, Paul Ramsey book, The Patient as Person, was designed to correct decades of paternalistic, physician knows best behavior, patients are there to listen uh, and to be told what to do. I'm summarizing 40 years of literature in one uh, sentence. But you know, we haven't spent as much time thinking about physicians and in this, in, as a proxy for healthcare providers more generally. They have ethical commitments, they have codes, they have professional practice standards, they want to do the right thing. So what about them? Um, a massive uh, issue uh, with, uh, with care data in the UK was, was just one example of how a breach led physicians to question whether or not they were, would be able to participate actively in the clinician-patient encounter when there was concerns on behalf of patients and also on behalf of physicians about the integrity of the system. Trust is not just one of those Berenstain bear ideas that like a broken lamp you want to put things together and hope everybody uh, feels better. It's actually, it takes one data breach to set back uh, clinical ethics or research ethics relationships uh, years if not decades. And saying we've fixed it does not give people an assurance. There needs to be ongoing uh, regular commitment uh, to fixing. The screenshot a little blurry is from some of our our own work at Indiana led by uh, Bill Tierney which asked physicians about their attitudes regarding electronic health records and the ability now to give patients what we would now call more granular control over the content of and the sharing of information within their EHR. Do I want my a cardiologist to know about the information that my psychiatrist knows? It's a really important issue. It's not u unique to a particular jurisdiction. Fascinating issue. Clinicians will tell you they'd love to have patients share information. In fact, the more the better. The more information they have, the better able they it can treat and, and look after patients. So there's a, a built-in ethics dilemma, uh, and that is the patient's mistaken belief, according to physicians, of protecting information is somehow better for them because they don't want to have a data breach expose personal or embarrassing information, whereas on the other hand, physicians without access to full information are, in the words of one, flying uh, partly blind or with one hand behind their back. So this uh, becomes one of our our challenges. Researchers are not immune from this problem as well. They're not just about collecting uh, and sharing. They've got their, their own issues. Uh, Russ Altman, uh, the Stanford bioinformatics uh, expert, uh, captured nicely the dilemma in uh, a paper in Science where this slide shows uh, this challenge of how we strike the right balance between interrogating someone's genetic information and the individual misspellings in one's genetic code. Uh, the $25,000 word uh, term is single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs. Everyone has in their genome between five and 7,000 of these misspellings, an A for a T, a C for a G. <laughs> and it's that particular uh, um, fingerprint that we all have that distinguishes Corinne from me. So if I'm a, a researcher, I want to know as much as I can about your genetic information. In particular, I want to look at those SNPs. The more I can, the more I can learn about you and maybe uh, care for you better. Well, the more I learn about you, obviously, uh, the more I've exposed potentially private information. So where's that, in this case, teal colored, not golden mean, between the right amount of privacy protection and the right amount of of research interrogation. There's no magic number. You're not going to get an empirical answer. It's not like um, you know, the art of motorcycle maintenance. The answer is seven. You're not going to get one particular line. This is a challenge. This is why this is an ongoing uh, conversation. This slide uh, captures work that uh, one of my postdocs did, Josh Rager and I, a couple of years ago, where we looked at the literature to find that all of the studies that showed the reasons why investigators would give for not sharing data. We came up with 73 reasons reported in the literature. It wasn't a systematic review, it was sort of a, a careful review of the literature. 
150 or so papers, and we extracted these reasons. You probably can't read all of them, so I'm going to make them simple for you. We collected them into three buckets. Those 73 reasons roughly divide into these three areas. There are professional reasons that disincline data sharing. Worries about receiving credit in publications or discoveries or losing a scientific advantage or worries about misuse of their data. It's the, the professional ego model, right? It's not insignificant, especially if you have grants and contracts and you've got a dean that says, show me your publication. The second bucket is what we might call logistical arrangements that inhibit data sharing. Some of these are as simple as we don't have enough people to share. I don't have the time to move my data set to your place. Or we don't have infrastructure sufficiently robust. Um, we don't have uh, uh, standards that allow us to share. These are a legitimate problems. I wouldn't call them moral problems, but they are problems that inhibit data sharing. And the third are our perceptions about the rules won't let me. So, you know, in the US, we looked at this for, for a number of years. People would claim that HIPAA, uh, the Privacy Act in the US, prevented you from sharing. And what you found out when you interrogated people was that they said, well, I had heard from a friend's brother's cousin that they knew of a researcher who was prevented. I mean, it became a, the shampoo commercial. Um, no one had actually read the Privacy Act, uh, and the same is true here in, in Canada, and I would submit to you uh, in most jurisdictions around the world. So let me conclude with a couple of, of observations. If physicians can provide better treatment with more data, and patients are prepared to, uh, to permit data sharing, and researchers can be assured that their objections, this is sort of the holy trinity in my view, if we're all rowing in the same direction, how do we proceed? Well, a couple things. One, let's keep gathering evidence. I alluded to uh, the CCA's uh, uh, report uh, from, uh, from last year, which was uh, asked, uh, requested by CAHR and has been found to be useful by a number of people uh, gathering this data. And they, they learned a number of things summarized here, and you can look at the, the work online. Uh, this is my plug for, for my organization. I should point out I have a, a board member here, uh, Axel Meisen, who's in the room. So uh, I hope he would also share that observation. Uh, but gathering data is, uh, is only one step. We, start to, we need to start to build and test some systems for amending um, or responding, rather, to some of those concerns. This particular screenshot from some work that we did at Indiana is one simple example. And it summarizes a long project where we worked with uh, those in our bioinformatics institute who were the ones designing and building electronic health records and electronic medical records, building them from scratch, including the dashboards, uh, the protections, uh, the red buttons, the break the glass issues, building in, how do you build choice and ethics into a physical structure? We have some suggestions there. Others are trying the same things. We should be experimenting with governance models. This is a paper from Science just last week uh, that uh, a number of us worked on, led by uh, Ted Dove, uh, a brilliant postdoc who's uh, now in Edinburgh working with Graham uh, Laurie, Bartha Knoppers, David Townend, and a number of us, where we have been sharing our experiences about how different organizations in different countries, from Australia to Canada to Kenya, have tried to figure out research ethics. So I'll close with this little observation from Evgeny Morozov, who says, you know, this isn't all about data and it's not all about ethics. Some of this is about how civil society imagines the role of democracy, the role of uh, society, and the way in which we imagine ourselves uh, participating for, uh, for public benefit. So I will uh, close there, and uh, if you'd like to get in touch, I'm happy to comment. I think I've left about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Thanks very much. First of all, thank you. I was really provoked by the things you said and it prompts a lot of thinking. I'm a former nurse and a former Minister of Health in this province. And we were at the time considerate of uh, the development of the electronic health record. Uh, throughout all the discussions I've heard before or since, 
I hear a lot about review and patient permission, etc. But I have really felt that until we teach young people to develop their own data, record their own and be responsible at some point for their own medical data, their own social emotional data, I mean the genome is part of it, but it's only a part of it. And I wonder if you have in your research encountered any ways to provoke societal movement to start recording their own data and or you know, organizing their lives with some accounting and diarizationization, of their own individual data? Uh, thank you very much, Minister. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Uh, the short answer is we've done a little, and there's a, a very, I think, exciting area of research going on in data, and it relates to social media and other platforms, and the way in which not just, I like to think of myself as young at heart, uh, I've got a a Twitter uh, account, I've got a Facebook account, I don't use Instagram, there's a bunch of things I don't use, I'm sure the list is long. But uh, I have two now adult daughters who were raised in the computer era, who were raised in the social media era. It would be unusual for them to call me on the phone, far more common for them to text uh, or to Skype or, or, or FaceTime. And what the research is starting to show, it's very early days, is a slight disconnect between the feelings of uh, privacy and identity, who am I, what, I, what am I about, in the environment of social media. People are happy to say, I'm at this restaurant, I'm eating this food, um, I've got a mole, look at it, I'm gonna show it to you, I'm gonna take a picture. Those are not considered health information disclosures like we might think they were. Tell people you have a mole. Are you kidding? You might be discriminated against in the only country in the G7 that doesn't have genetic discrimination. And never mind, so um, a side comment. So we're seeing a disconnect between attitudes about identity, uh, personhood, and community in, we call them young people, but the millennials, and the traditional model of health information. So what I, what I have seen is a breaking down, and a good one in my opinion, between these silos. We call health information historically the stuff that happens in hospitals between physicians, nurses, nutritionists, social workers, and patients in that clinical environment. And we know now that in fact that information matters very little relative to the overall health of individuals and communities. Far more important to look at the biome, far more important to look at poverty, far more important to look at education, the list that I'm sure you and your capacity uh, in government were quite aware of. So what the research is showing now is describing what I might call mapping that terrain. We know it's different. How we translate or you know, go across that valley of death between all information that might be useful and that which might be valuable in a health environment is a great research opportunity. The diarizing model that you've suggested has been tried in a number of countries. It's, uh, it's too early to tell whether it's working, but the willingness of people to share information online is both a blessing and a curse. Great if they think it can be used to help them. Horrible if it also means that later on they're not gonna get a job because you just interviewed someone and found out that fill in the blank. So it's an exciting area and I appreciate you raising it. Thanks very much, Eric, for bringing up all of these uh, different aspects, one of which you didn't touch on so much um, and I'd like you to uh, consider. It seems that there's a bit of a skepticism regarding the data um, if we are even able to harness it. From the genomics perspective, I've heard it said in the context of even if the patients know, they're not changing their behaviors. Um, if we put that at a different scale, it seems like even if we present this evidence to some decision makers, policy makers, um, it doesn't seem to change their behaviors. Uh, how do we bring about those types of changes based on the information and how, how, do, how do you drive the sort of, to make evidence informed decisions at a personal level, at a policy level, um, what needs to happen next to see that movement? So it's a, it's a great question. It's um, probably the, the $64 billion question for all of us. We can have all the data in the world, but if we can't use it, 
um, apart from people who just like hoarding data because it's good to have for later on. But the idea, if we're using public money, even private money, to generate this, shouldn't we be also spending our time figuring out how to, how to implement? Uh, I would say that this has been one of my passions for the last uh, number of years, looking at the impediments to translating evidence into policy. I am in no way suffering any misconception uh, that presenting data to a, a politician, presenting data to uh, um, uh, the private sector will somehow magically turn on a light bulb that says, oh, now I know that smoking causes cancer. Didn't know that before. Thanks very much. We're going to pass a law prohibiting cigarettes tomorrow. Thank you for the data. I didn't know that. None of us suffer that, that uh, misunderstanding. And that's because science presents only one uh, component of the policy uh, toolkit necessary to implement change. You're alluding to, I think, Teresa Marteau's important work that has shown we could give people a lot of information about their genetics, about health, and they still do stupid things. Or they do things that they prefer to do. Others think it's stupid, but if they want to engage in risky behavior, so be it. If they want to smoke or bungee jump um, or do any number of other things, that's what the autonomous individual in our society is allowed to do. So I think this is where the area of implementation science, regulatory science, translational science policy all need to get together. Those are the, the policy equivalents of rare disease research. We don't have enough money focusing on lowering those barriers and figuring out how to transgress or, or transpose that kind of policy valley of death. I, I have lots of ideas and I think all of us in the room are waiting with bated breath for the answer. Uh, you know, I refer you to my prior comments, the answer is seven. Um, we'll have to figure that out, but I'd like to see more and hopefully a little pitch for the, the current federal government and all the provincial governments that are engaged in, in evidence-based decision making. A wonderful opportunity. This is the best time in the history of the country to attack these issues. So thanks uh, very much for a very informative and challenging uh, talk, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm a physician and I'm just transitioning out of the role of Chief Medical Information Officer for Alberta Health Services, which is our health delivery organization here. And as part of that, we're planning, uh, we're in the planning stages of what we think could be a really exciting opportunity for a province-wide clinical information system. So when I think about your comments about public view of information sharing, um, do you have any data to tell us what the phenotype is uh, regionally in Canada? Is that part of your work? Could it be? And secondly, um, what advice would you have us have for us in terms of engaging that conversation uh, more broadly because it's clearly going to be a critical enabler? So I have, uh, the reason that I'm smiling is I have two answers. One is the, uh, the academic brain in me is firing on all cinders. I got lots of ideas. The president and CEO of Council of Canadian Academies side of my brain says, this would be a wonderful topic for, um, for a CCA, whether partnering with um, federal and provincial uh, governments to, to work on. So, you know, we should, we can chat later. But let me stick to my script of these are my remarks and how I think about this. I, I love your expression, what's the phenotype? Partly because there are some, um, forgive the expression, there are some data about the phenotype of people who are willing to uh, share and engage. And there are people who have had good experiences, who have been informed uh, in advance about what will happen uh, to their information or their data, and who trust. It's a horrible word to sort of throw out at the end of a, of a morning breakfast. But who trust not only data custodians, but every part of the, the food chain to be acting in the interests of two parties. And this is where I think the, the new phenotype uh, that I'm hoping exists um, will, will reveal itself. The individual I'm interested in what happens to me model is not gonna get us where you're going. We need to be looking at a public benefit model that has so far been suppressed in, in science and I think really in, in medicine. The idea of my participation in society is not only good for me, but good for others. It works in certain areas like public health. 
But even in public health, we're not doing a terribly good job. We haven't figured out, and I've got lots of data from all over the world that show people's willingness or unwillingness to get vaccinated for reasons that are probably familiar to this room based on the wrong science. I mean, you can decide not to be vaccinated, I guess, if you choose to for reasons that make sense. I don't like people not getting vaccinated for the wrong reason. So the idea of a public benefit model of how contributing to the overall health and wealth of our community is something where the, the, the science is starting to come along and where I think we've got examples from places like uh, from France. There's a little bit in, in Singapore that I've seen. We can, we can chat afterwards. But the phenotype is not a very simple um, uh, uh, description of one person wanting to feel better about not being hacked. They have to feel engaged in the entire process from, uh, uh, from data construction uh, to data implementation. And maybe this will be our last one if it goes to nine. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for an excellent talk and a great perspective. And I'm Linda Woodhouse. I come from the rehab sector and currently the president of the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. And despite what they look at us from south of the border and say we have a, a national system, we actually do have a two-tiered Canadian healthcare system. And I don't mean Quebec and the rest of Canada. I mean yeah. public <laughs> yeah. and truly private. And over the last decade, we've seen probably 60% of rehabilitation now in the private sector. How do you address that great divide, especially when we look at clinical information systems that only allow you to share data if you're inside the public system and not bridge that, that great divide between public and private? And yeah, it, it's a, a great question. I know we're coming to our, our time, so I'm happy to pick, up, pick it up with you afterwards uh, if you'd like. I'll give you two, uh, two quick responses because I think there's two answers um, to your question. One relates to the public-private bid and whether that's a, a real impediment or whether that's, um, one, as I described earlier, a perceived impediment. We can't do this because we're not allowed to. Whenever anyone says we're not allowed to, I always say, really, that's your answer? You're not allowed to? How about we try and allow you to do it rather than erect a barrier that's, that makes no sense? The second, so that the public-private bid is, is, it's not a non-starter or uh, I'll just say that it, it, it's got its own uh, unique bit. There's another more challenging problem, which I also believe is not, as the phrase goes, it's not a wicked problem. It's not so hard that it can't be solved. It's actually a tame problem, and it's the data sharing across jurisdictions. The Australia example I showed you, uh, there's two parts to that story. One part is how wonderful is it that the people in Western Australia want their data to be used for research? Turns out the data in the Western Australia data set cannot be shared with Queensland, cannot be shared with New South Wales, and it can't because there have been barriers erected federally between states. Much like we have, and I put barrier in a small b here, but we have similar barriers between provinces and territories and the federal government. I don't believe that these are um, wicked problems to solve. I actually think they are solvable and there are groups and there are organizations who are now trying very hard at the level of interoperability, at the level of standard setting. So if all that, all that we're left with is a jurisdictional battle or a jurisdictional dispute about how the flow of information moves across, then I would encourage people to look at the history of Canada and the building of the railroad as a way in which we can probably make sense of a federal system, of a federated system, a confederated system, where data moves freely for the betterment of the country. And I know that sounds charming and, and, uh, and, uh, and all very well and good, but I don't see these as impossible to solve as if it were uh, we don't know how to map and sequence the human genome, but we have this really cool idea of doing it. Or we'd like to go to the moon and return someone safely to Earth at the end of the decade, and we haven't built a rocket yet. This is not one of those problems. We already have several good examples. ISIS in Ontario. I've read a little bit about what's going on uh, here in Alberta. I think there's some phenomenal test examples. We need to leverage the, the respective governments' uh, willingness to start to experiment. That's what the slide experiment with governance was meant to convey. Put it on a first minister's agenda if you'd like. Anyway, I've taken probably our time, but thank you very much for your question and to all of you for coming.
So thank you very much, Dr. Meslin, on behalf of the AIHS and the IHE Board of Directors and staff, we really appreciate the opportunity to host you here in Alberta. So thanks again. I'll just make one more plug and then everybody can get out of the room. I know people have places to go. Um, but thanks very much for coming and I'd like to let you know that the next Health Policy Speakers Series event is happening on May 5th and we're really pleased to be able to host Nobel Prize recipient Sir Paul Nurse from the Francis Crick Institute in London. So I hope that you'll be able to join us. Thank you.